Hello, Zogola from Northern Ramblings here. To all those who happen to follow the standard Gregorian calendar, have a happy new year! In honor of my last video of 2015, and since I'm fairly sure there won't be any new mind-blowing last-minute game releases coming, I figured I'd list my 7 favorite games of 2015. And in honor of New Year's, and because I don't want this video to be like the 8 million other best of lists on YouTube, I'll also be briefly going over my most anticipated games of 2016. Whew. And what a year this was, particularly for epic RPGs like The Witcher 3, Fallout 4 and Xenoblade Chronicles X. None of which you'll see on this list for various reasons. Same goes for other good titles like Bloodborne and even the 3DS versions of Majora's Mask, which I really enjoyed, but which is still fundamentally just a rehash of a 2000 Nintendo 64 game. No, the games you'll see here may not be objectively the best, but ones which I had the most fun with this year. Hell, some people might consider these games outright bad, but I stand by my reasons. Number 7. Dragon Ball Xenoverse Yeah, remember how I said that some people may even consider the games on this list bad? This might be an example. Some background. The Budokai series are some of my all-time favorite fighting games. When I heard that the creator of these games, Dimps, was making a new DBZ game for the next generation, I was naturally stoked as hell. And I have every right to be, what well, with the great features. Character creation, a really enjoyable single-player mode, 3-on-3 three -three battles, online and local multiplayer modes. Surely this could end up being the best Dragon Ball game yet. Well, not really. If you've been following Team 4 Star's gaming channel and their Let's Play of Xenoverse, and if you haven't, then what have you been doing? You'll know that this game is also really repetitive and the action RPG elements are implemented too badly to call this a real fighting game. But even with these and many other flaws, the sheer amount of content and great fan service for DBC fans allowed me to stay invested in this game for many months early this year. Arena, where he sent his toughest fighters to challenge Raiden's greatest defenders in Mortal Kombat. Number 6. Mortal Kombat X I've never really been a fan of this series, since I always saw it trying to go for shock value with its brutal fatalities rather than trying to be a good fighting game with good mechanics like its Japanese brethren. But then I got a PS4 earlier this year and decided to get Mortal Kombat X just for fun and because of the multiplayer elements. And surprise surprise, this game was actually good. The mechanics are simple but very enjoyable, and making combos straddles just the right line of complicated and accessible. The single player campaign may not be the greatest, but it still beats what most other fighting games have to offer. The game gave us many great new characters, my favorites being Aaron Black and Johnny and Sonya's daughter Cassie Cage. And while the fatalities still go for shark value, I'm glad Netherrealm decided to make them as over the top as possible. Cassie's selfie fatality may be the most stupidly funny thing I've ever seen. Cassie wins. Fatality. Won't you spend? Number 5. Until Dawn As shitty as Konami's decision to axe Silent Hills was, this year has still been a good one for survival horror, and my favorite horror game of the year has to be Supermassive's Until Dawn. What initially seems like your typical teens in the woods slasher really takes off after a while and the game really delivers a nice balance of jump scares and psychological horror. But even more than the atmosphere, I appreciate the choice mechanic. Sure, Mass Effect, The Walking Dead, and so many other games have promised us that our choices matter and crap, but in the self-contained story of Until Dawn, it really does feel that way. And sure, we've seen these barely playable interactive movies a lot recently, but Until Dawn has most of them beat in sheer detail. The graphics are superb, and the characters are all well designed and acted, especially Peter Stormare as the creepy fourth wall breaking therapist. Sometimes these things can be a little scary even terrifying, but I'm here to make sure that no matter how upsetting things may get, you will always find a way to work through it. Number 4. Undertale Like with Until Dawn, the less I say about the plot of this game, the better. But having played it recently, I can confirm that both the story and the gameplay are all worth the praise that the game has been showered with. The innovative way of attacking and defending and the ability to spare most of the monsters you come into contact with were great gameplay innovations. The dungeon that your unlucky character falls into is full of creative puzzles and the game's whimsical sense of humor is just brilliant. But like with most games I play, I paid most attention to the story, which is easily some of the best I've read this year. And all the feels I've experienced playing this game can attest to that. Number 3. 
Metal Gear Solid 5: The Phantom Pain. The Phantom Pain is the game that I really hoped was going to be my game of the year. I love the series and Snake Eater is one of my favorite games of all time. I waited this game for 7 years hoping it would clean the shitty aftertaste that MGS4's hour long epilogue left in my mouth, and for a long time it did. The big open world environments, the huge amount of stuff to do, the improved shooting and sneaking mechanics, the soundtrack, the adorable dog. This game should have been great. But it suffers from a hollow, disjointed story and a main character who barely seems to say or do anything of relevance. Some gameplay choices, like the long, boring helicopter rides, really kill the enjoyment towards the end. And Skullface, hilarious as he may be... Such a lust for revenge! Ooh! ...is not that great of a villain. And the less said about Quiet, the better. Sure, she's a badass and can end up being super useful in the game, but I can't defend the hypersexualized outfit she has to wear in any way. Any explanation the game offers us is pure bullshit. At least her voice and motion capture actors did an amazing job. And while the twist near the end may have angered some, the story felt so irrelevant and the mission so repetitive that I had went past the point of caring in the second act. But if I thought that the game was crap, I wouldn't have put it as number 3. For what it is, it's a great stealth action game with really cool mechanics. Out of respect for Hideo Kojima and, of course, Big Boss, I still put this game as a great one-off. Just not the epic conclusion to the story that I expected. Number 2. Rise of the Tomb Raider The 2013 reboot of the Tomb Raider franchise is one of my favorite games. While not perfect, it was a game that I couldn't really find any major flaws in. Great writing, memorable characters, fun puzzles, visceral action and a Lara Croft who actually felt like a real person, thanks to Camilla Luddington's voice acting and Rihanna Pratchett's writing. The sequel has all those things and more. In fact, at first the game may feel a bit too similar to its predecessor. But with Lara having matured to a true action hero, the sequel raises the bar in every possible way. Everything just feels more epic this time around, and even the graphics feel better, allowing for a truly awesome adventure. Number 1. Life is Strange Wow, another Choices of Consequences preaching game that mostly just picking dialogue options. How lame is that? Well, actually, it's not lame at all, and I stand behind my choice 100%. The core mechanic of the game, the ability to rewind time, works brilliantly. The game has a lot more puzzle solving and interaction than most recent games of this genre, most puzzles requiring you to use your ability in creative ways. But even with that, when I played the first episode, I thought the game was merely okay. The second episode, however, especially the feels heavy ending, is what really got me hooked. Life is Strange's writing is the best I've seen in almost any game ever, tackling heavy subjects in a way few games do. This game goes to some really dark places. But like with other games, to say too much would give it away. And it's the characters that really got me hooked. The protagonist, Max Caulfield, is incredibly relatable with her geeky, introverted, but still curious and occasionally sassy persona. Even more interesting and awesome is Chloe Price, played perfectly by Ashley Birch. She can sh switch from a supportive friend to fucked up pain in the ass to a potential love interest at a drop of a hat. Sure, the game's ending wasn't quite what I hoped, but overall, Life is Strange is still my favorite game of 2015. Finally, here are some games that I'm really looking forward to playing in 2060. What were your favorite games of 2015? What are you looking forward to playing the next year? What did you think about my choices? Leave a comment below to tell me and I'll see you all again in 2016. Have a happy new year.